This program presents ways to optimize health and well-being. When considering lifestyle changes, please consult with your healthcare provider to ensure they are suitable for you. Hello and welcome. I'm Casey Vakurka. When was the last time you spent some uninterrupted time out in the bush or by the beach, in the fields or among the flowers? How did it make you feel? Refreshed? Alive? Invigorated? Stay with us as we dig deeper in understanding the link between nature and health. On this program, we explore ways that you can shape your lifestyle as medicine. Today, we are looking at the fascinating topic of nature as medicine. And I'm excited because joining me is the Director of the Lifestyle Medicine and Health Research Center at Avondale University, Dr. Darren Morton. Darren, it's thrilling to have you with us today. Thank you for coming on the program, Will. It is a pleasure to be here with you, Casey. Yeah, good, I'm glad. Now, Darren, you're, you're an educator, you're an author, and you're also an internationally recognized lifestyle medicine expert. So I'm curious to ask you, why do you like lifestyle medicine and what do you like most about it? Oh, wow, this, I don't know the program's long enough for me to go into all the details, but <laughs> look, I'm, I'm just really passionate about um, the fact that there are things that we can do. You know, what lifestyle medicine, essentially what it's all about is, is addressing the causes mm. of the, um, the conditions that many of us suffer from and, and die from mm. nowadays. And what we know is that these, these chronic conditions, as we refer to them, are lifestyle related. Yeah. And, and we have a, a healthcare system that I think in some regards has got it a little bit wrong because it's not really healthcare, it's more disease care. Mm -hmm. we, we, we manage the symptoms of the, the conditions that we suffer from. Lifestyle medicine says, let's go back to treat the cause. Yeah. And so I really, that, that appeals to me. That mm. makes logical sense. And to my scientific brain, um, I find that you know, really, really encouraging. Nice. And, and for me, it's a hopeful message. You know, yeah. It's actually at the heart of it. What it teaches us is that there are things that we can do to influence our health. Mm. And so I think that that's a really important, key, hopeful message mm. that people need to hear. And that's really then empowering, isn't it, for, for the everyday person if Absolutely. they know what they can do to improve their well-being at the causal level. Yes, yeah. exactly. Excellent. Okay, and so the other thing I was curious to ask you about is um, from watching your presentations and programs, you seem to have quite a, a, a love for the outdoors. And I'm curious, why do you love getting out in nature so much? Oh, you know what? That's a great question. I think it's just maybe it's nature, maybe it's nurture. Okay. I don't know. Maybe it's a little bit of both, but yeah. I do. I've actually, my, my happiest place is being active outdoors. Yeah, there you go. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really drawn to. There's something great about the great outdoors. There is, isn't there? <laughs> we, have, we say that all <laughs> the time, is, don't we? There is. <laughs> you know, just this morning. I probably shouldn't be telling this just in case my, my boss at the university is watching this, but you know, I went out, um, I was out surfing this yeah. morning. And, oh, wow. And there's something special about that. You know, there's something mm. sacred about being in, in environments like that. You know, the sun mm. was coming up, I was out there amongst the waves. It was just... What a great yeah. way to start the day. It is. And you come home and, and, and it is, it's, it's medicinal. Yeah. It's powerful. That's awesome. And so you seem like the perfect person to be talking about this subject of nature as medicine when you love getting out so much. So take us into that subject about nature exposure and how do we know that that really can make a difference for our health? Mm. You know, I think that there's obviously anecdotally, mm. we know this. I mean, I don't think, um, well, I, I've just shared my story. Yeah. It was interesting. We're up at um, up the, the coast of New South Wales a little while back and I took my youngest son, Caleb, out mm -hmm. and we're out in the water there and we had these stand-up paddle boards and we're paddling around. Oh, nice. And then all of a sudden, a turtle pops up. Oh. Like just out of nowhere. And, and I remember he had this, this expression on his face and he, and he actually just paused for a moment. He goes, Dad, I just love being here. Like there's something about, you know, being in those sorts of spaces yeah. that, that, that and anecdotally we, we know, you know, does, does us well. 
Um, and look, there's certainly a lot of evidence to actually suggest that it helps our physical health, mm. but certainly there's very, very powerful evidence to suggest that it helps our mental health. Mm. Um, in fact, there's, there's a, a famous quote that says, the further we are from nature, the less happy we are. Mm. And I think there's, there's, there's a really powerful truth to that. Yeah. So yeah, look, there's, there's overwhelming evidence nowadays that connecting with natural environments mm. is really, really good for our bodies and for our brains. Mm. Um, so much so that the, the um, American College of Lifestyle Medicine um, they have identified, and, and lifestyle medicine, I should say, around the world is just exploding. Oh, yes. Um, so it's a really exciting mm. movement. Um, but within the, the lifestyle medicine community, that there's sort of a, six established pillars of lifestyle medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I won't go through all of them, because mm. the, 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 the time doesn't allow us to do that, but there's actually a push now to introduce an, an additional, a seventh pillar, which would be nature. Is so that right? nature as medicine. Wow, that's fantastic. Mm. And so when they've, when they've done, like there's different research, obviously that's been done, a lot of research has been done on this subject. Mm. What kind of things are they actually researching, like in terms of the exposure and, and the environments that people are going into that qualifies as in nature therapy? Like, mm. what does it look like yeah. in the research? It's really quite interesting. And, and um, from, a, from a holistic point of view, mm. what there, there's been several studies which actually look at what happens if we put people in very blue and green spaces. Mm. This is one of my, my favorite sayings. I always talk about blue and green should often be seen. Yes. <laughs> um, but we know, for example, Japanese researchers, there's been a lot of work done there where they get people and they, they actually refer to it as forest bathing. Mm. And this is where you take people and you immerse them in these environments that are very rich, you know, very you know, rainforesty, if you like, yeah. um, very naturally dense. Mm. And, um, and what we know is when people ex do that, when people are exposed to those sorts of situations, um, that all of their health metrics, and it's not just their mental health, you mm -hmm. know, as we often, we, we, we can relate to that because we, we go out, you know, I know when I go for a run or go for a mountain bike ride or paddle or surf or whatever, I do come home feeling better. So yeah. I can sort of report that. But what we know is there are changes actually happening within, within us. Mm. And, uh, and some of the evidence behind this is really quite fascinating. For example, um, we know that the, um, your immune system is actually enhanced when you ex expo are exposed to natural environments. Mm. So for example, after about two hours of exposure to um, an, a really sort of blue and green space, natural environment, uh, natural killer T cells in your body, which fight off infections and, and diseases, we see an increase in them. And what's really intriguing, uh, some of the research has indicated that they will remain elevated um, for about seven days after. Wow. Now, obviously, you're getting that, that sort of decline of if yeah. you don't get that constant top up to your, to na to your natural environment. But, um, you know, I, th I find that incredible. You know, there's something about nature, you know, something about immersing in ourselves in these sorts of spaces mm. that would do us well and serve us well for even a week after that. Mm, so that's definitely. physiologically. We know other, um, you know, physiological changes that are happening inside us. We know that when people have, uh, for example, pot plants, you know, yes. plants, in their um, in their workspace, uh -huh. um, or in their office, or in their home, mm -hmm. uh, that reduces um, a, um, blood pressure. Is that uh, right? Yes, yeah, so, and there's there's good evidence to suggest that. Wow. Um, it almost seems to be. I actually have a, a PhD student at the moment who's working on a project looking at what he refers to as our ecological self, huh. you know, our connection to these natural environments. And there is some evidence. And, and this is it's interesting. A lot of the work in this space is is still new and, and, yeah. and emerging and evolving yeah. but um, it seems if you have about 10 or well, he recommends that people have about 10 pot plants 10 plants in their home yeah it seems that that seems to confer optimal benefits 10 is or more right? 10 and I said to him why is that is yeah, it yeah. You know, is that there's just more greenery does yeah. it produce more oxygen and it seems that what might be related to is that the fact that when you have about 10 mm. or more you actually need to care for them so you actually have to invest, you have to actually connect. And so, um, yeah, so it's that connection piece, you know, to yeah. nature, we know is really powerful. Yeah, so clearly um, the, these fake pot plants, fake flowers, they're not <laughs> gonna quite cut it, are they? Well, you don't have to water them as often. That's as, true, uh, as they're not gonna <laughs> die on you as quickly. They won't, which is a plus. <laughs> um, my mum is an incre she has an incredible green thumb, so oh, she's good. amazing in the gardens. That wasn't passed on to me. Oh no. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, there you go. But that's so interesting that it's it's like 
um, like we are not isolated even from the natural world. Like if we are, it's not going to have as big a benefit as if we're actually connected in yeah. some way. It's so fascinating uh, how that works. And I guess we're still trying to understand that, we aren't are, we? We are. And we're trying to understand the mechanisms. Bob yeah. Chair, maybe I can comment a little on that. But, mm. but what we certainly know is that um, many people today mm. are disconnected from natural environments. Yeah. And for example, we know that on average, the, well, the average adult probably spends about 94% of their time indoors now. Wow. Separated, you know, unless you've got yeah. those pot plants around, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, separated from, from natural environments. And even we know, for example, um, there is re-engineering of environments, like for example, architects mm -hmm. are very aware now that people, for, their, for, for the best health of humans and the best functioning of humans, mm. uh, we know that people need access to these spaces. So for example, window views mm. of nature. We know that that's actually linked in hospital settings. When people have a, a window view to nature, they tend to take less painkilling medication. Interesting. Uh, we know that in that people have that have more access to natural environments. Um, uh, even a window view from your home results in less domestic violence. So, so there's something about this the innate connection. It's almost mm. like we're designed yes. to inhabit natural environments. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like that is is where we're going to most likely thrive. If yes. the more connection points we have with that, I know sometimes in today's society it can be challenging to build those connections in. Mm. But uh, that's really incredible. Mm. So, do you have any any um, research or understanding of how being exposed to nature mm. actually can make us feel better yeah. in terms of what's going on that yeah. causes that. Is there anything? Yeah, that's great. That? That's that's a great question. And so mm. there are probably a number of different mechanisms mm. by which this is occurring. And so I'll just I'll just refer to a couple of them. Yeah. Um, first of all, sight. So okay. our eyes. What we need to understand is that our brain. Our brain is a fascinating thing. Mm. Um, you see, our brain sort of sits in this black box, which is our skull. Yeah, true. <laughs> and um, and it and it relies on what it's told to receive information in terms of how to interpret what's going on in the world around it, around mm. it. And like so, so it's very reliant upon our sen its senses. Mm. You know? So our senses feed information to our brain to tell our brain, you know, how to feel and how to optimally function and all the rest of it. And, and a very large input to your brain, obviously, is your, uh, is your optic nerve. Mm. And what we've discovered is that sitting on top of your optic nerve, as it leads to your brain, um, is, a, is a cluster of cells referred to as the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So that has quite a big name. Yes, yes. But, but what these cluster of cells are doing, we know that they're very much involved in modulating mood and emotional, um, emotional states. And, um, and what's interesting is these cells are very, very much influenced by how much light they're exposed to. Mm. And so one thing that we definitely know, and there's a lot of work going on in this space at the moment, is that um, exposure to bright light. Mm -hmm. right? And you actually, it's really quite interesting. If you look at how much light you're exposed to when you go outside as compared to indoor mm -hmm. environments, there's a vast contrast there. Mm. So I'll, just to illustrate, um, it's outside on a bright sunny day, you can be exposed to around about 100,000 lux. Right? Oh, wow. Now 100,000, that's a big number. Yes. Lux is just a measure of the, the intensity or the okay. brightness of the mm -hmm. light. In a brightly lit indoor environment, you're probably exposed to about 500 lux. Wow, that's so So that's a, that's a very sharp contrast. Yeah. What it seems, from our best guesses, is that um, this suprachiasmatic nucleus, mm -hmm. sitting in, you know, and just mm -hmm. on top of your optic nerve, probably needs about 10,000 lux mm. for at least 30 minutes each day for you to be emotionally well. Wow. So you can see now, you know, bright sunny day, 100,000 lux, that's a lot of lux out there. You probably need about 10,000 lux for 30 minutes each day. But if you spend all of your time indoors, you know, with 500 lux, it's really hard to get up to those levels. And mm. so, so there's actually now um, a lot of work being done. Well, and, and there's been early evidence which has hinted at this for a long time mm. anyway. For example, in countries of high latitude, mm -hmm. uh, we have a condition that's affectionate well, not really affectionately, but known as SAD, yes. which is Seasonal Affective Disorder. Yeah. And what we know is that that's when during um, the winter periods where there's very low lighting for, for months, people, that suprachiasmatic nucleus sitting mm -hmm. on top of their optic nerve, not getting adequate light exposure. And we know that depression is very high. Mm. You know, suicidal ideation is very high. And so there's actually now a lot of work being done um, using what they call bright light therapy. Mm -hmm. And that this is for people who can't get outside 
for at least 30 minutes when the sun's shining, to actually use artificial sources of light that also beam about 10,000 lux wow. and, and getting exposure to that. And we actually know, there, there, there's, there's several studies now showing that bright light therapy can be as effective or even more effective um, than antidepressant medication for Is relief right? of things like depression. Wow, that seems... So, so certainly, you know, in terms of mechanisms, we, we def it seems that, that light has a big is, a big, is a big factor. But mm. so are colours. Um, mm. We actually know that colours elicit, um, you know, different emotional states in people. Mm. We even know that it's just that, just the, the image of a particular, for example, landscape views. You, there, there are studies being done where they put people in functional MRI machines. Mm -hmm. they're, they're measuring their brain waves, and then they flash up images in front of those people so they can see, and they see what, what about how do our brains respond to this? And what we know is that when you flash up urban sort of cityscapes. Typically, it reacts in our brains in not, not positive ways mm. because for that, for our brains, that, that, that's an alarming sort of space. Whereas you put up natural environments, um, then it's calming. You know, it actually activates regions in what we call a limbic system of our brain that are, that are more, you know, associated with positive emotional states. Mm. So, yeah, it's really interesting. So certainly sights are influencing and na nature provides us with the right kind of um, stimuli in terms of sights that our brain really, really finds appealing. Hmm. But it's other things too. It's, it's, it's smells, it's sounds. You know, we actually, and it doesn't, it's not hard to understand that, um, that certain sounds can have very strong negative yes. connotations. Like it's you hear like someone- Stress rises as you hear it. it. Does, <laughs> you, know, you hear someone scream and yeah. it's like, you know, there's an instantaneous response to that. That's true. I was actually with a, um, with a, a parent of, of five young children just wow. a couple of days ago. <laughs> and all of a sudden we heard crying and it was like instantly, you know, that, that, that sound for her. And then, yeah. she, and it was, it was interesting. She went, that's not one of mine. <laughs> so it was obvious that there were more children <laughs> around as well. She was still concerned, but, yeah. but you know, we know that sounds elicit emotional responses, yeah. but there are other sounds which actually elicit very positive emotional states as well. Mm -hmm. And we know, for example, things like moving water mm. is very calming. Yes. Uh, we know that, you know, bird sounds, natural sounds. There's something about natural environments that stimulates our eyes, that stimulates our ears. And even our, our, our smells and textures um, that, that, that we almost mm -hmm. become taste, we can always taste nature mm. in some way, like wet rain. You know, like just oh, yeah, after yeah. that rain, that there's something about that there that is. changes our emotional states. Yeah, wow. So it's probably really quite multifaceted. yeah. But, but certainly there are a lot of stimuli that nature supplies that mm. it does our brain and our bodies a whole lot of good. As I'll tell you, I'll speak to one other one, which yeah, is yeah. quite in, intriguing, a little bit esoteric, but, but still mm -hmm, early mm -hmm. in its research. But, but even air quality, we know, has, can have a profound effect on people's health statuses. Mm. Um, so much so, there is evidence to suggest that um, if you have, and I'm, I'm intrigued, as I say, even this, is that we talk about, um, you know, one of the so Alan White talked about this whole idea of what is health and the pillars of health. And yes. she, she, it's interesting that a famous statement that she has, she talks about pure air and sunlight. Yes. Right, really speaking to that, that sort that of environmental direction. piece. Mm. But the pure air, um, what we know is that people of, that live in high in altitudes where the air gets thinner um, actually have, um, well, it's related to body weight. Really? Yes. As so in we actually, more or less? Uh, less. Less, yeah. okay. And, and the reason for that, and there's probably a couple of reasons, but one is that um, as you increase in altitude, um, CO2 levels start to change mm. in your body. So you actually get this thing called respiratory alkalosis, which changes your feeding behaviours. You tend not to be as hungry. Mm. But we actually think it might shift certain physiological processes in your body that, that, that change your weight status. Wow. And what's really interesting about that is that we know that, say, over the past... Um, you know, 30 years or so, mm -hmm. we've actually seen increase, rising levels of CO2, 50% yes. CO2 levels in the atmosphere. And we've seen concomitant um, increases in obesity around the world as well. So there's, there's mm. actually even some theories, and once again, they're a little bit out there, so yeah, I won't yeah, yeah. dive too deep into the science, but they're emerging that the, the, the air quality yeah. that we're immersed to affects 
physiological processes which in turn affects their health yeah, outcomes, that's so such as things like obesity. Yeah, and I guess because you'll probably get a lot more of the CO2 in areas like city environments because of all the pollution that's in there compared with a natural environment where you've got the fresh air, fresh air, Absolutely. you just feel it, you know, you go there and you're just like, well, I just want to breathe this in because it's so good. That's correct. So, and indoor spaces as well. Yeah, so in true. indoor spaces where mm. you don't have adequate ventilation, you know, there's some estimates that CO2 levels can be up to 50 times higher. Wow. Wow. So yeah, I think there's some really interesting That's work. So this is a this is a budding space, but yeah. it, certainly there's a lot pointing to the importance of us getting out to nature and exposing. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just yeah, it's just fascinating to think of and see all the different angles that this could be impacting. Like this is a really mm. um, comprehensive influence, isn't it, in yeah. our, our lives for our health, having this nature exposure. Yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit about uh, what we know um, about how much exposure can have meaningful health um, outcome improvement. Yeah, and that's a great question because mm. often when we're talking about um, you know, value of exercise, yeah. or nutrition or whatever, everyone wants to know what's the dose response? Yeah, yeah. You know, what's the do how much do I need to do? <laughs> and it. often, you know, maybe the subtitle of that is what's the minimum I need to do? Yeah. <laughs> like certainly when it comes to exercise, what's the minimum I could get away with and still experience these mm -hmm. benefits? Um, what we find, and this occurs with most of the pillars of lifestyle medicine, is that typically the, the more the better. Yeah, interesting. Um, however, what's that minimum amount? And, and when I say more the better, it's interesting that there's, there's often a, a sort of an, a U-shape relationship mm -hmm. here too. We know that you know, not enough of something typically isn't, produces not good health outcomes. Um, if you can get optimal amounts, then it's ideal. Overexposure can be problematic too. Mm. Um, so, for example, sunlight, that's yeah, really beneficial, case, isn't it? very beneficial and obviously mm. for the production of things like vitamin D and the like, but over sun exposure can actually re can, can cause you know, other issues as well. So, so I think trying to get that balance right mm -hmm. is important to consider. But in my humble opinion, I think that um, the more nature you can be immersed in, yeah. you know, uh, then the, the better um, better it is for you. Mm. What a lot of the studies seem to be concurring with is that uh, when it comes to sunlight, and you know, and, and I mentioned already about the you know getting your ten thousand lux of, of mm -hmm. sunlight, mm -hmm. probably thirty minutes a day okay. is is sort of ideal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the the research that's been done looking at single exposure, like if I just did if I if I spent X number of minutes in nature, would I get benefits after it? Seems like probably about two hours. Mm seems to give some good long-lasting benefits like mm -hmm. for several days after but um, there is a dose response there if you can spend four to five hours in a single hit so for example going for a, a nature walk for yeah. four to five hours you'll definitely have benefits retained within your body for about a week wow. after that so yes yeah, so it's, it's we're still the science is still emerging mm. um, certainly if you could have a two hour block mm -hmm. at some point throughout the day where you're really exposed in a natural environment. Ideally, even four to five hours would be better still. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that daily dose too, yeah. of, of half an hour is, is something to, to aim for. Yeah, and so with that, with the 10,000 lux mm. thing, just a question practically speaking, um, what about a cloudy day? Are we gonna get that? Yeah. 10,000 for that kind of a day or is it, do we have to wait for the sunshine all the time? Yeah, and this is and in some parts of the world it's hard. To yeah, do yeah. Um, so what the, what the evidence seems to suggest there is that full sunlight, mm -hmm. the sun's beaming down, mm -hmm. um, probably about 100,000 lux. If you are in on a sunny day but standing in the shade, mm -hmm. you're probably still exposed to about 25,000 lux. Wow, it's still decent. Yeah, and even on a, a quite overcast day, you've probably got sort of in the order of 2,000 lux out there. Okay. Which mm. means, that, which is still a whole lot better than outside, indoors. The inside, yeah, for sure. Um, and so what it means, you probably need to spend more time out there. So Right, so is it a cumulative effect? It can, yes. Ah, yeah. It seems, once again, the science is still, still Figuring that out. Yeah. Mm, that's you know, we, we can we can enact this, and it's not that hard to do. Mm. For example, um, the difference between eating your lunch indoors just, can just mean going and sitting outside. Yeah. And you know that that's thirty minutes where you're outside, and and what we don't realise is that we're immersed in all of those things. And the more natural environment that we can create for us, yeah. We know in schools, for example, they're doing. Um, 
uh, like outdoor classrooms where they'll actually have like a, a hedged area with greenery oh, that and, then the, and then the kids do their, have, have a class in there. And, and what's really nice about that, I actually visited my, my local school mm -hmm. has, has set up an outdoor That's classroom awesome. like this. Yeah. And you go and you sit in there and even though it's in quite an urban environment, because there's this whole wall of, you know, sort of high trees and plants greenery. around you, they have a water feature in there, mm. feature in, in there as well. You come into this and you're in this little sort of micro environment and you, mm. you could honestly feel, it feels like you're in the middle of the, the forest somewhere, wow. even though on the outside beyond the, the, the confines of it, um, it's quite urban. So we can do that. You know, if, imagine if you're in your workplace, for example, mm. or in your home, you had some little place that you could create that was your little sanctuary that sort of yeah. had more of the blue and green in it. Yeah, and there's so much scope that you can do that in small ways and larger depending on your situation. Yeah. Um, are there any other practical ways that either you've applied or you've seen others applied um, for bringing this more into this into our lifestyles every day like in this current modern world? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think there's real power in re-engineering our environment, mm. and um, and I, for example, I do this with relate, relating to be more active. I, mm. I actually have my printer um, set up two stories below. Okay. Me. So I physically every time I print something out, I have to walk two stairs down. Yes. And then often I get down there and I printed it wrong, so I have to go back up <laughs> and, and read More it. Steps to clock up. <laughs> but, but we can do the same thing with with our in, environment. I mean, I think yeah. it's just about being intentional. And, yeah. and could it be um, that I could just get more pot plants in my, mm. in my, my space? Mm. Could I actually work closer to a, a window oh, yeah. with the window open? Mm. Could I have my lunch outside? Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of it just boils down to that intentionality. Yes. You know, and, and how, how can I make use of the, the spaces that are, that, that are around me? Mm. Um, and yeah, so I think that, that intentionality piece, mm -hmm. is, there's this small things that we can do to feel like we're living in more of a blue and green space. Yeah, that's so interesting. And it seems like often we can just get caught up into how we've always done something. Yes. And then you don't, you sort of are somewhat blinded as to what you can change. But then yeah. if you take a step back and have a new approach or a new perspective of like, oh, how can we actually fit this in? Yeah. Then you might get some inspiration of, oh, we can do this here and that there and just fill in all of the gaps. So. For sure. Yeah, wow, that's so interesting. Thank you so much for coming and sharing with us today. I am so excited to see what more is gonna develop in this space because mm. as you say, it's an emerging field. And so there's still a lot um, that we're gonna learn <laughs> as the evidence comes in and as we get to understand a bit more about what science is. But we don't need to wait for the science. That's we true. We all know anecdotally it works. So yeah, that's true. Good on you. Thank you for sharing and I really appreciate that. And um, yeah, look forward to taking those opportunities myself as well, even more. So thank you. Um, so we've been talking today with uh, lifestyle medicine expert, Dr. Darren Morton, about how being immersed in nature is like medicine. And I hope you've enjoyed this topic just as much as I have. May we all be inspired to go outside and be blessed with the benefits nature exposure offers to our health and maybe even find different ways of bringing it indoors too. If you have questions or comments about this program or if there is a topic you'd like us to discuss, contact us on health at 3abnaustralia.org.au. We're so glad you could join us here today on this program and look forward to next time. Remember to shape your lifestyle as medicine.